On April 8, 1966, the front cover of Time magazine was completely black, except for three large and powerful words, Is God Dead? In 2001, to answer this question, the atheist emeritus professor of philosophy at Western Michigan State University retorted, God is not dead in academia. He returned to life in the late 1960s and is now alive and well in his last academic stronghold, the philosophy departments. Tonight you will witness two scholars with diametrically opposed positions debating the most important question a person can, a person can ask themselves in their life. Does God exist? I'm grateful that you have chosen to come to this debate and hear both sides of this issue in your pursuit of truth. So thank you for coming. My name is Jonathan Mann. I am the president of Ratio Christi here at Kennesaw State University. Ratio Christi is a student organization that equips university students and faculty to give historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for believing in the Christian worldview. We meet on every weekly on Wednesday nights in the Social Sciences Building, room 3030, at 730, and everyone is welcome to attend and engage in the discussion. Uh, even on this Wednesday's meeting, we're actually going to be hosting one of this evening's debaters, Dr. David Wood, who will give a lecture and Q&A on the topic, what is the Quran's view of the Bible? So I welcome any one of you to attend and bring your questions. Uh, I would like to thank Kennesaw State University and Johnson's Ferry Baptist Church for all their support in making this event possible. I would also like to personally thank Rashio Christie at Kennesaw State University's faculty advisor, Dr. Victor Marshall, for his support in this debate and the student organization. I also thank Rashio Christie at KSU's co-directors, Dr. Jean and Christy Williams. Finally, I would like to thank this evening's moderator, Dr. Michael Sansevero, and the debaters for being willing to participate in this debate, Dr. David Wood and Dr. Michael Shermer. I would like to introduce this evening's moderator, Dr. Michael Sansevero. Dr. Sansevero has served as the Dean of Students at Kennesaw State University since October 2010. He, re he received his BA in Educational Research, Philosophy, and Religion. He received his MS in Higher Education Administration at Florida State University and his PhD he received at Georgia State University in Educational Policy Studies. At, here at KSU, he also teaches in the University College and is a senior faculty member of the Keller Graduate School of Management. Would you all please welcome Dr. Michael Sansevera. Good evening. You're allowed to say good evening back. Good evening, thank you. Medina students, after all, you have to engage with me. Um, so as you heard from the little announcement over your head, if you have not already had a chance to silence your cell phones, please make sure to do that. Um, also, we are gonna be holding all applause um, to the welcome when I first introduce um, our uh, guest speakers, and then at the end of their closing remarks, you can applaud then as well. Um, but please otherwise hold all applause during the rest of the debate. Our purpose this evening is to introduce our community to different viewpoints. The purpose is not necessarily to win the debate, but to share insights and perspectives that will hopefully generate continued dialogue. I'm honored to serve as your moderator this evening in this conversation, and I look forward to hearing from both of our speakers. Both of our speakers bring incredible knowledge, experience, insights, perspectives, and I look forward to all of you giving both your undivided attention. So first, I'm gonna go ahead and start with an introduction of Dr. Michael Shermer. Dr. Michael Shermer received his PhD in the history of science from Claremont Graduate University. He is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, a monthly columnist for Scientific America. He is presidential fellow at Chapman University. His new book is The Moral Arc, How Science and Reason Led Humanity Toward Truth, Justice, and Freedom. He is also the author of Why Darwin Matters, Evolution and the Case Against Intelligent Design and the Science of Good and Evil. He regularly contributes opinion editorials, book reviews, and essays to the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, Science, Nature, and other publications. His two TED Talks, seen by millions, were voted in the top 100 of more than 1,000 TED Talks. So please join me in welcoming to our stage Dr. Michael Shermer. Thank you. 
Dr. David Wood received his PhD in philosophy from Fordham University. He is a member of the Society of Christian Philosophers, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and the Hume Society. He is a contributor to the books Evidence for God, 50 Arguments for Faith from the Bible, History, Philosophy, and Science, Defending the Resurrection, and True Reason, Christian Response to the Challenge of Atheism. Dr. Wood is a former atheist, and his incredible jaw-dropping story is on YouTube and has over 400,000 views. Search David Wood, Why I Am a Christian to check it out. He has participated in more than 50 moderated public debates. These include debates against the top Muslim apologist, Dr. Shabib Ali, um, and the populist atheist, and the popular atheist, John Loftus. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Wood to the stage. As moderator, I will also be keeping time um, and inviting our uh, speakers um, to keep the program moving along. And when it comes time for the Q&A, I'll be giving further instructions to the audience as well. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started with our opening statement from Dr. Wood. Good evening. I'd like to thank Ratio Christie for arranging our debate tonight and Kennesaw State University for hosting. Every day on the internet, I'm told that there's a battle raging with science and atheism on one side, united against the diabolical forces of religion on the other. The German physicist Max Planck saw things quite differently. Planck, who won the Nobel Prize in physics for his work on quantum theory, said this, religion and natural science are fighting a joint battle in an incessant, never relaxing crusade against skepticism and against dogmatism, against disbelief and against superstition. And the rallying cry in this crusade has always been and always will be, on to God. For Planck, religion and science stood together against the extreme positions of uh, skepticism and disbelief to their left and dogmatism and superstition to their right. I'm glad to see that Planck's crusade continues here in the Peach State. I'd also like to thank Dr. Shermer for representing the forces of skepticism and disbelief this evening. Uh, I started reading Dr. Shermer's column in Scientific American back in 2002. The first installment I read was titled, Shermer's Last Law. I finished reading, reading it and thought to myself, brilliant, but wrong. <laughs> Hope I get to debate this man one day and straighten him out. So thank you, Dr. Shermer, for making a 14-year dream come true. Now, on to God. There are dozens of arguments for the existence of God, but to keep things simple, I'll only be presenting one here in my opening statement. I'm somewhat reluctant to call theism a hypothesis because I think it functions differently from the way hypotheses typically function, but since theism is under investigation tonight, I'll call it a hypothesis for purposes of this debate. Treating theism as a hypothesis, my argument runs as follows. Premise one, no hypothesis in history has more scientific confirmation than theism. As we'll see shortly, this is a tremendous understatement. Premise two, no hypothesis in history has more scientific disconfirmation than atheism. This also is a tremendous understatement. Conclusion, if we have any respect whatsoever for science, we must accept theism and reject atheism. I call this argument the defibrillator because it's shocking and may lead to revival. <laughs> to the untrained mind, of course, the defibrillator may sound absurd. Some people, after all, have been raised to believe that science can function apart from theism, and it never occurs to them to question what they've been taught, and so they now believe by blind faith that God is not necessary for science. If you're one of those people, prepare to be defibrillated. <laughs> to begin, we need to draw a distinction between ordinary scientific hypotheses, little s, little h, and the scientific hypothesis, capital S, capital H. Ordinary scientific hypotheses are tentative claims 
about the world, usually based on some sort of observation, claims that are confirmed or disconfirmed as relevant evidence comes in. A hypothesis becomes much stronger if you not only find lots of confirming evidence, but also discover why the hypothesis is correct. So you notice a piece of copper conducts electricity, and you put together a scientific hypothesis, all copper conducts electricity. Then you test your hypothesis by getting different pieces of copper and seeing if they too conduct electricity. You find that they do. This supports your hypothesis. Then you ask why copper conducts electricity, and you discover that free electrons in copper can move through the metal, and this makes copper a good conductor. There are tons of scientific hypotheses being tested around the globe, but all of these ordinary scientific hypotheses are ultimately derived from the scientific hypothesis, capital S, capital H. The scientific hypothesis is the hypothesis on which science as we know it rests. There are three key elements of the scientific hypothesis. One, the universe can be understood. Two, we can understand it. And three, it's good for us to understand it. If you don't believe that the universe is at bottom rational, you're not going to spend years of your life gathering data to figure out its laws. If you don't believe that human beings are capable of understanding the universe, why waste your time trying? If you don't believe that it's good to understand the universe, why would you want to? So intelligibility, the universe can be understood. Capability, we can understand it. And desirability, we want to understand it. These are the three key elements of the scientific hypothesis. And all three have to be in place for science to get off the ground. In the 21st century, we take the scientific hypothesis uh, for granted. We believe that the universe can be understood, that we're the kinds of things that can understand it, and that it's good for us to understand it. But there was a time when the vast majority of people didn't believe these things. They didn't believe that the universe could be understood, or that we could understand it, or that it was good to understand it. And so even though there were some scientific achievements among the ancient Greeks, and the Egyptians, and the Chinese, and the Muslims, there was never anything that would amount to a revolution in our way of thinking about the world. But in the 16th and 17th centuries, a group of devout atheists decided to uncover the secrets of the universe. And these atheists produced an explosion of scientific research in the budding fields of astronomy, physics, chemistry, and biology. Oh, did I say atheists? I meant Christians. They were all Christians. Here we might wonder, why did these Christians dedicate their lives to understanding the universe? Let's ask them, and we'll allow them to answer from their own writings. It's time for Q&A with the pioneers of the scientific revolution. Here goes. First question. Nicholas Copernicus, the publication of your book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres generally marks the beginning of the scientific revolution. What were you thinking when you started this revolution? Copernicus's actual response. To know the mighty works of God, to comprehend his wisdom and majesty and power, to appreciate in degree the wonderful workings of his laws, surely all this must be a pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the Most High, to whom ignorance cannot be more gratifying than knowledge. Now that's odd. Sounds like his scientific research was grounded in his religious beliefs. He thought he was worshiping God by studying the universe. I guess we should ignore him and move on. Tycho Brahe, you spent decades recording astronomical data, and your measurements were five times more accurate than the best measurements available before you. Why did you spend so much time studying the stars? Brahe's response, those who study the stars have God for a teacher. Studying the stars because you want to learn from God. How weird is that? Galileo Galilei, you're called the father of modern observational astronomy. Why did you decide to give birth to modern observational astronomy? Galileo's response, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. When I reflect on so many profoundly marvelous things that persons have grasped, sought, and done, I recognize even more clearly that human intelligence is a work of God and one of the most excellent. Johannes Kepler, 
You sifted through astronomical data year after year in order to come up with your three laws of planetary motion. Why did you do it? Kepler's response, our piety is the deeper, the greater is our awareness of creation and its grandeur. Since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it befits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else of the glory of God. Rene Descartes, you wrote early texts on optics, anatomy, and psychology, but you're also the father of modern philosophy and the master of methodic doubt. Surely you can cast doubt on all this talk about God. Descartes' response, I see plainly that the certainty and truth of all knowledge depends uniquely on my awareness of the true God to such an extent that I was incapable of perfect knowledge about anything else until I became aware of him. Blaise Pascal, mathematician, physicist, philosopher, inventor, pioneer of probability theory, aren't all these other scientists being unreasonable? Pascal's response, there are two kinds of people one can call reasonable, those who serve God with all their heart because they know him, and those who seek him with all their heart because they do not know him. Robert Boyle, father of modern chemistry, pioneer of the experimental method in science. What drove your research? Boyle's response, the vastness, beauty, and orderliness of heavenly bodies, the excellent structure of animals and plants and other phenomena of nature justly induce an intelligent, unprejudiced observer to conclude a supreme, powerful, just, and good author. In the book of nature, as in a well-contrived romance, the parts have such a connection and relation to one another, and the things we would discover are so darkly and incompletely knowable by those who, that precede them that the mind is never satisfied until it comes to the end of the book. Antony von Leeuwenhoek, father of microbiology, you constructed such amazing microscopes that you were the first scientist to observe and describe microorganisms. Why did you want to see what eyes had never seen? Lewin Hoke's response, it is to be hoped that the inquirers into nature's works by searching deeper and deeper into her hidden mysteries will more and more place the discoveries of the truth before the eyes of all so as to produce aversion to the errors of former times which all those who love the truth ought diligently to aim at. For we cannot in any manner better glorify the Lord and creator of the universe than that in all things, how small forever they appear to our naked eyes, which have yet received the gift of life and power of increase, we contemplate the display of his omniscience and perfections with the utmost admiration. Isaac Newton, physicist, co-discoverer of calculus, considered by many to be the greatest scientist in history. Your laws of universal, universal gravitation and motion provided the grand synthesis that concluded the scientific revolution. Tell us what you think of atheism. Newton's response, atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. You seeing a pattern? The scientists of the scientific revolution would roll over in their graves if they heard a bunch of 18-year-old atheists claiming to be champions of science just because they follow Richard Dawkins on Twitter. So why were Christians the pioneers of the scientific revolution? Here, our atheist friends often insist that it was just dumb luck. Anyone could have done it. And if Europe had been filled with atheists, it would have happened even faster. But this is sheer nonsense. There were cultures and civilizations around the world. Plenty of people had the opportunity to study astronomy and physics and chemistry and biology. But these branches of science all took off at roughly the same time in one particular civilization. It only makes sense that we should ask, why? The problem is that when we ask the people who did it, why, they immediately start talking about their belief that the universe was created by a rational being and that since human beings were created in the image of this rational being, we can understand the universe and that by setting out to understand it, we're worshiping God. As for atheists thinking that they could have come up with science without Christians doing it for them, uh, let's take a quick trip to planet reality. Atheists would have been the last people to ever start a scientific revolution. Why is that? Well, anyone can do science now. 
because we all accept the scientific hypothesis. We all believe that the universe can be understood, that we are the kinds of things that can understand it, and that it's good for us to understand it. But the pioneers of the scientific revolution already believed these things before they set out to prove them. They believed them based on their theology. They came up with a method of proving them, and that method became the scientific method. Now, if you are an atheist before the scientific revolution, would you have any reason to think that the universe is governed by neat little mathematical equations? Of course not. It wouldn't make any sense to say that a falling rock is going to obey an equation. A rock doesn't have a will, can't obey anything, so intelligibility goes out the window. What about capability? If you were an atheist before the scientific revolution, why would you think that human beings are capable of figuring out the laws of nature? Even if you happen to think that there were laws of nature, which as an atheist I doubt you would, why would you think that you could discover them? You're not made for that sort of thing. You're not made for anything. You'd have no idea how you got here and no reason to think that you're capable of figuring out how you got there. So you'd be trapped in a kind of bubble with no escape. How about desirability? Supposing, for the sake of argument, that you believed that there were laws of nature, which again, I don't think you would, and that you believed that human beings could discover these laws, which again, I don't think you would, why would you want to? I understand seeking knowledge that has some practical benefit, like growing better crops or building an air conditioner, but from an atheistic perspective, What's the point of seeking knowledge that has no practical benefit? So the three key elements of the scientific hypothesis make absolutely no sense given atheism, but all three make perfect sense from a Christian perspective. Long before the scientific revolution, in the universities of Europe, which, oddly enough, were founded by Christians, medieval philosophers and theologians laid the groundwork for science even before the universities were formed. Augustine said, let the Bible be a book for you so that you may hear it. Let the sphere of the world be a book for you that you may see it. Augustine tells us to read the book of nature. Recall Kepler declaring that astronomers are priests of the highest guard, of the highest regard, to the, I mean, uh, priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature and Boyle comparing the universe to a romance novel that you can't stop reading until you reach the end. Thomas Aquinas argued, since human beings are said to be in the image of God by virtue of their having a nature that includes an intellect, such a nature is most in the image of God in virtue of being most able to imitate God. Only in rational creatures is there found a likeness of God which counts as an image as far as a likeness of the divine nature is concerned, rational creatures seem somehow to attain a representation of that type in virtue of imitating God, not only in this, that he is and lives, but especially in this, that he understands. We are created in the image of God. One of the main features of this image is that we have an intellect and we reflect God's understanding when we understand. Medieval theologians also emphasized the correspondence between our cognitive faculties, our reasoning ability and so on, and the world. We're made to be able to understand the world. So out of theism, particularly Christian theism, flowed a set of ideas about the universe, about human beings, and about the goodness of knowledge. These ideas permeated Christian civilization. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Christians developed a way of confirming these ideas scientifically. How do you confirm the, the scientific hypothesis? By testing lots of ordinary scientific hypotheses in different fields. Every ordinary scientific hypothesis that's tested, whether it's confirmed or disconfirmed, is confirmation of the scientific hypothesis. In other words, whenever you test an ordinary scientific hypothesis, you're confirming that the universe can be understood, that we're the kinds of things that can understand it, and that it's good to understand it. But the scientific hypothesis is a set of ideas that flowed directly from Christian theism, ideas that are indefensible given atheism. Moreover, when scientists investigated the world, they eventually found further confirmation 
of theism, such as the beginning of the universe out of nothing, the fine-tuning of the cosmos for life, and so on. Now, if every scientific hypothesis that's ever been tested is confirmation of a set of ideas that flowed directly from Christian theism, and if the testing of these hypotheses led to even further confirmation of theism, what can we say? We can say that no hypothesis in history has more scientific confirmation than theism. But we can go even further. Since every scientific hypothesis that's ever been tested is confirmation of the scientific hypothesis, and as we've seen, all three of the key elements of the scientific hypothesis are fundamentally at odds with atheism, we can say that every scientific hypothesis that's ever been tested is disconfirmation of atheism. And if every scientific hypothesis that's ever been tested is disconfirmation of atheism, it's clear that no hypothesis in history has more scientific disconfirmation than atheism. The only conclusion to draw from all this is that if we have any respect whatsoever for science, we must accept theism and reject atheism. And so, echoing Sir Francis Bacon, one of the great pioneers of the scientific method, we can say that a little science inclines man's mind to atheism, but depth in science brings men's mind to religion. Thank you, Dr. Wood. We will now welcome Dr. Schirmer to the podium. Can you hear me all right if I walk around just a little bit? Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, uh, Ratio uh, Christus and Kennesaw State. Good to see you all. Um, I need to unplug the defibrillator here uh, before I actually start my uh, opening statement. But first, just a curiosity of show of hands. How many of you believe in God? Holy shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, look at the time. Oh, boy. <laughs> Wow. Uh, well, I, I used to be a Christian. I used to be a believer in God, a theist. Uh, I was an evangelist. I went door to door witnessing to people. We called it Amway with Bibles. Uh, and then later I became an atheist, a sort of a born again atheist, and I went back to those same doors and said, take it all back. I was wrong. <laughs> and then I became a militant agnostic, like the bumper sticker says, I don't know and you don't either. Uh, but then, see, the problem is, is the terms. The terms are loaded. Uh, theist just means you believe in God. Atheist, you just lack a belief in God. But there are strong atheists who believe that they can prove that God doesn't exist or show that it very likely doesn't exist. Or weak atheists that just lack a belief in God and just sort of leave it at that. Agnostic is actually a term I used for a while. It was coined by Thomas Huxley in 1869 just to mean that God is unknowable in any scientific, rational sense. It's just an article of faith and nothing more. But then when I was on the Colbert Report, Stephen told me in the green room when he asked me about my religious beliefs that an agnostic uh, is just an atheist without balls. So I thought, well, <laughs> come on, Shermer. <laughs> uh, so, you know, now I'm a skeptic because that's the name of my magazine. But really, it's just, um, I, I think it's very unlikely that there is a God. We can't prove that there is nothing. We can't prove a negative. But just follow a thought experiment here for a second. Over the last, say, about 10,000 years, humans have created about 10,000 different religions and about 1,000 different gods. What is the probability that Yahweh, the God that uh, David believes in, is the one true God, and that Amun-Ra, Aphrodite, Apollo, Baal, Brahma, Ganesha, Isis, Mithras, Osiris, Shiva, Thor, Vishnu, Wotan, Zeus, and the other 986 gods are all false gods. Do I have any believers in any of the gods I just read off? I have one taker. Which one? Zeus, yes, all right. <laughs> so like me, the rest of you are all atheists. Some of us just go one god further. It's a pretty simple idea. That's the trend in the history of science is to go in that direction. But even if David convinced you that the arguments are in favor of God's existence, this doesn't prove that Yahweh is the, is the right God. It could be one of these other gods. 
if you decide that the reason and evidence points to a god, it could be one of these other gods. It could be an extraterrestrial intelligence, as I wrote about in Scientific American. How do you know? Okay, now I'm going to go off the page and just respond a little bit to the, to the defibrillator argument, uh, as it were. It's irrelevant, the religion of the scientist who pioneered science. Some of this was correct, some of it not quite. It's a little more subtle than that. I'm a historian of science, but it's like saying, you know, all the great art in, in medieval Europe was done by Christians. All the great music was done by Christians. Everybody was a Christian. It was almost against the law in some countries to not be a Christian. So who was going to do the music? Who was going to do the art? Who was going to do the science? In any case, it's irrelevant. What the, 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 it might as well say that, that they were all dog owners. So what? It, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. As for atheism, atheism isn't a thing. It's just a lack of belief in God. That's it. Full stop. I, I'm also an, a, an A Bigfootist. I'm an A UFOist. I'm an A, uh, I was going to say Trumpist or something, but I didn't really get <laughs> politics in there. Um, it, it, it's not a belief system. There's no like set of tenets. This is what atheists believe. It's just what we don't believe. We just don't believe in God. Full stop. That's it. Now let's talk about something else. If you don't believe in God, but you believe in, say, civil rights, civil liberties, human rights, women's rights, gay rights, animal rights, you believe that people should be treated equally under the law, and so on and so forth, you're probably a humanist or a secular humanist or an enlightenment humanist, but it's irrelevant. You can be a Christian and believe all those things. You can be an atheist and believe all those. It doesn't matter. So this is a complete non sequitur. This is not an argument for anything because there is no atheist worldview. All right. Now, on a point of logic, the burden of proof is on David to prove the existence of God, not on me to disprove the existence of God. I can't disprove Apollo and Zeus and all that. But we can, we can sort of shade our probabilities of belief by the accumulative evidence for or against the God hypothesis. There is no atheist hypothesis. That, that, that isn't a thing. Either you think there's evidence for God or, or you don't. And, and there's no alternative to that that has to be defended. All of these arguments, by the way, look like this. God, X looks created, whatever it is, the eye, the universe, planets, DNA. I can't think of how X was created naturally, therefore X was created supernaturally. This was, in essence, the argument he was making by rattling off all the scientists, Tycho Brahe, Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and so on. You know, they ran up against certain mysteries in their fields and said, well, I can't figure it out. I guess God did it. Newton has a famous quote. I'm surprised that my intelligent design creationist friends don't use this quote, in which he talks about the stunning alignment of all the planets in this flat plane, the plane of the ecliptic which all the planets are going around in the same direction. They're all in this flat plane except for Pluto, which is no longer a planet, so it's not a problem. <laughs> and he says, uh, you know, it's, it's just I can't explain, I can't figure out how this could have come about. This must have been the providence of the divine creator. But no one makes that argument anymore, which is why my intelligent design creations friends don't use that quote, because we now have a cogent theory for how solar systems are formed. Naturally. All you need is gravity and some stuff in certain right configurations of how far apart they are and so on, and planets naturally form. We now know that virtually every star in the galaxy has a planet. Completely natural. You don't have to have an intervening God to step in to stir the particles to make that happen. In the long history of science, this is what happens. People invoke the gap. They say, well, I can't think of how this could have come about naturally, therefore, it must have been supernaturally. The gaps are being filled. That's what scientists do. And their graduate students, especially. <laughs> that's, what, that's what graduate students are for, to fill gaps. And eventually, those gaps will be filled. And then where goes your religious faith? If you hook your faith to... 
There's this gap here. These guys can't explain this thing here. Whatever it is, the fine-tunedness of the cosmos, DNA, the eye, whatever. You can't explain that. That I'm hooking my, uh-oh, he explained it. Everyone accepts it. Happened naturally. Uh-oh, now what? Now what do I do with my faith? Okay, that's the problem. In any case, if you invoke the God hypothesis, there's a creator did all this. Any being capable of designing particles, atoms, molecules, DNA, protein chains, cells, organisms, planets, stars, and universes can't be simple. Such a being would have to be as complex as or more complex than her creations. Thus, by all theistic arguments for God's existence, there must be a God's God who created the Christian God. And if you continue to make that argument, then there has to be a God's God's God that made the Christian God ad infinitum. Now, you can't just say, well, you've got to stop the causal chain somewhere, and I'm stopping it at my God. Why? You're the one who initiated the argument that there has to be a designer behind the complex system. So, who designed the designer? Well, the designer is that which does not need to be created. Why can't the universe be that which does not need to be created? Because the universe is a thing and it has to be created. Well, maybe God is a thing. No, God is not a thing. God is an agent. I'm an agent. You think I was created. So therefore, God would need to be created. And so forth. So that's the problem with all those uh, arguments. Now I'm going to make two arguments tonight against the idea that there's a God and in favor of the idea that we invented God. The biggest problem uh, I see for a theist, is the problem of evil. So pick two. One, God is all-powerful. Two, God is all-good. Three, evil exists. You can have two of those. You can't have all three. Here's a few numbers for you. According to UNICEF, about 29,000 children under the age of five die each day, mainly from preventable causes. That's 21 dead children every minute 10.6 million a year. That's the equivalent of a holocaust every year. More than 70% of these 10.6 million children deaths every year are attributable to six causes, diarrhea, malaria, neonatal infection, pneumonia, preterm delivery, or lack of oxygen at birth. Science's response is, well, give them those things. Religion's response is, those are part of God's plan. Really? What kind of plan is that? What kind of God, who is all-powerful and all-good, would not stop that? Now, I'm not talking about homicides, gang warfare, civil wars, and strife in Syria. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about innocent children who have no free will. They're not freely choosing to die from horrible diseases and cancer. Why would God allow that to happen? An all-powerful, all-good God a less than powerful or not so good God, or no God at all. The problem with explaining evil for religious people, for theists, is what I call the irrefutable God problem. When good things happen, who gets the credit? God did it. He works in wonderful ways. He's answered my prayers. He made a miracle. When bad things happen, who gets the blame? Not God. Or he works in mysterious ways, don't you know? What does that even mean? So no matter what happens, the God hypothesis is confirmed. What would disconfirm the God hypothesis? Good things happen, so God is. Bad things happen, so God is. What would have to happen to refute this causal explanation of evil? In the Christian worldview, nothing can refute it. It's irrefutable. It's a simple assertion. It's true by asserting, I hereby say it's true. And that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence, as the great late Christopher Hitchens once said. One of my favorite examples comes from my friend, the late great Carl Sagan. I call it Sagan's Dragon. He has a chapter in his book, The Demon Hunted World, called I Have a Dragon in My Garage. I have a dragon in my garage. Would you like to see it? It's really cool. You open the garage door, you look in. 
I see some paint cans, a ladder, a bicycle. I don't see a dragon. Ah, it's an invisible dragon. Oh, an invisible dragon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I got some infrared cameras here. We can detect the body heat of the invisible dragon. Ah, well, you see, this dragon is a cold-blooded dragon. It doesn't give off any heat at all. Hmm. Ah, I have some spray paint. We'll spray the, no, no, it doesn't stick. It's a non-corporeal body. Oh. We'll put some flour on the, on the floor, and then when it walks around, we can see its footprints. Well, you see, this dragon hovers above the ground about three feet. Ah, the fire, fire-breathing dragons. I have some other equipment here that can measure fire. Uh, this is a special dragon. It, it has cold fire, oh, cold fire. So Carl said, what's the difference between an invisible, floating, cold, undetectable, invisible dragon and no dragon at all? He said, well, but I feel the presence of the dragon's love. I feel it in my heart. That's nice. That doesn't mean there's a dragon there. We can imagine and conjure all sorts of things that make us feel good or bad. That doesn't mean the dragon's real. Yeah, but you know, one time I, I, I prayed to the dragon and my headache went away. That's interesting, but you know, headaches do tend to go away after a couple of days, take a couple aspirin. Well, but you know, one time my relative got a cancer and I prayed to the dragon and the tumor went into remission. Yes, okay, that, that's getting more interesting, but you know, Tumors do go into remission occasionally, not as often as we would like, uh, but you do hear about these. So that's not really evidence for the dragon. It could be some other medical explanation. Well, but you know, I'm just unsatisfied with the problem of evil, so I think the dragon makes evil things happen, and so on and so on. You get the point. What's the difference between an indetectable, invisible, cold, <laughs> God, whatever, and no God at all. This is the problem with the problem of evil. When you follow this line of reasoning, this is like playing baseball without the bases or the ball. This is like what I call the witch theory of causality. If your theory of evil if your explanation for storms and disasters, plagues and diseases and accidents is that women cavort late at night with demons, then you're either insane or you lived 500 years ago in Christian Europe when everybody believed in the, in the uh, witch theory of causality. This was the Christian theory of evil. Exodus 22, 18, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Today, no one in their right mind believes this. There's not a Christian in this room that believes this nonsense. Why? Because science debunked the witch theory of causality, as it has been debunking all of these religious theories of causality. Because religion has no method of testing hypothesis. It's the invisible dragon and nothing more. What's the Christian theory for all this ultimately? Bad things happen because the fall in the garden and original sin that we're born with because we've fallen away from God and thus we are free to sin and do evil. Yeah, but what about the children with the leukemia or the children die? Well, you know, God works in mysterious ways, don't you know? There's some reason for this. Just go back to those kids. Imagine you're a parent of one of these children who just dies right there. Of preventable. God could have intervened at any moment, and he didn't. Why? Well, what possible moral lesson are you supposed to draw from this? The solution to this evil, we are told, is to accept the sacrifice of the deity, which exonerates you from anything you did in your life, no matter how evil it might have been. Just think about that. You could be a serial killer on death row in Texas and find Jesus. This happens, don't you know? 
As it happens, I've read all 414 final statements of the executed prisoners in the state of Texas for a research project I'm doing. And uh, about 90% of them found Jesus in, in, uh, in prison. Not surprising, there's a big Christian ministry there. Are we to believe that these men, if they accept Jesus at the last moment, after the brutal crimes that they committed, they, they get to go? And Jews don't? Muslims don't? Native Americans never heard of Jesus before Europe, Europeans came here? They don't get to go? What about the hundred billion people that lived before us? Before Jesus, it was about 90 billion. They don't get to go to heaven. It's just the way it goes, too bad. They didn't accept Jesus. This makes Christianity something of a cult of human sacrifice, but instead of the sacrifice of children or beasts of burden as practiced by primitive religions, it's the updated 2.0 version, the sacrifice of one child, the son of God. This brings up my last point, my opening statement. So, David, I presume you are a monotheist. Christians are monotheists. God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent, and so forth. We were created sinless because God gave us free will. And Adam and Eve chose to eat from the tree of knowledge and so forth. We're born with original sin. Okay, first of all, this goes against the, all Western jur jurisprudence. You are responsible for your own sins, not anybody else's. And you are beholden and should be sorry to the people you harmed, not somebody else. Still, God could just forgive the sin we never committed, but instead he sacrificed his son Jesus, who is actually just himself in the flesh, because Christians are monotheists. So this violates the law of identity. A is A. A cannot be non-A at the same time. So the only way to avoid eternal punishment for sins we never committed from this all-loving God is to accept his son, who's actually himself, as our savior. So my final sentence. So God sacrificed himself to himself to save us from himself. This is barking mad. Thank you. Okay, we will now go into our first round of rebuttals. And to start, Dr. Wood. Thank you, Dr. Shermer. I'm going to uh, jump right into some of his comments. Um, he began by pointing out that we all reject most gods and that atheists just go one god further. Uh, there's a problem with that. We, we, we were already down to one, right? Um, and well, you know, some people just go one god further. Well, there's a world of difference between one and none. Um, here's a podium. Uh, let's suppose we try to understand how this podium got here, and uh, some of you believe that many people got together and built the podium, and that would be uh, polypodium builderism. And others say, no, just get one good podium builder, then that, that's it. And we'll call that monopodium builderism. And then you've got the atheist who says, there was no podium builder, the podium just is. And we say, well, that's absurd. And the response from the atheist, it seems, is, well, you rejected all those other podium builders. I just went one more than you. Yeah, but we were already down to one. And in going from one to zero, you go from common sense to nonsense. He says, uh, atheists just don't believe in God, defines atheism negatively. But before that, he, he acknowledged that there are different definitions of atheism. I find this one kind of odd, though. It, it's like saying, uh, uh, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. I just go, you know, we, we're all vegetarians with respect to elephant meat and tiger meat and gorilla meat and so on. Uh, we just go a few meats further than the rest of us. We're not claiming anything by claiming to be vegetarians. Uh, we're all vegetarians with respect to most meats. Well, if you're not a vegetarian, then you're just not a vegetarian, right? It, it doesn't matter what meats you don't eat. It's, uh, it's kind of, do you eat meat at all? And so the idea that you know atheists just don't believe in God, um, that is a position. You see, when you tell me 
that you're a vegetarian. You're not just telling me that you don't eat meat. You're telling me that whatever you consume to keep alive comes from elsewhere. You've told me something positive. And likewise, if you say that you're an atheist, yes, you're denying gods, but you are telling me something positive. You're telling me whatever you're going to use to explain the world or anything else is coming from elsewhere, and it's the elsewhere that we investigate. Dr. Shermer said, well, if God were proven, it could be any God, uh, could be an extraterrestrial. I would disagree with the extraterrestrial. If you're talking about an alien or something, we're talking about the origin of the universe and the fine-tuning of the cosmos, then you're talk you'd be talking about an alien outside of the universe, and um, I'm not sure that's what most of us mean uh, by alien. Um, but he said if God were proven, it could be any God. Well, for purposes of this debate, uh, of, of course. Um, but if any God existed, that would, that would be affirmed. That would be the affirmative statement have been affirmed, right? And atheism would have been refuted. He said that the religion of the pioneers of the scientific revolution is irrelevant. Now, if I were just doing this as an appeal to authority and saying, hey, look, lots of people believe in God, that would be absolutely ridiculous, because you can point to lots of atheists who are scientists and so on. Uh, that's not what my argument was. My argument was there were tons of civilizations, tons of cultures down through history, and these guys didn't just conveniently happen to be the ones who came up with science. Their views on the world and what they are and the importance of knowledge and their ability to find this knowledge came out of their theology. These came out of the medieval schools. And they found a method of going out and testing them. And so this was, in a sense, one massive hypothesis proposed and tested and confirmed. But the core beliefs that led them to go out and do this research were grounded in Christian theism. So how is that irrelevant? Right? It's one mass, it's like saying any hypothesis you come up with and you go out and you test it and you prove someone, but it's irrelevant. It's not irrelevant. That's, it's grounded in their ideas. It wasn't just, hey, these people happen to be ones that stumbled upon a rock one day. This is their ideas led them to certain conclusions about the world. They tested them and they were confirmed. He said that in the olden days, God was used to fill gaps, but the gaps are being filled by science. Interestingly, the, all the earliest people who put forward this God of the gaps criticism were Christians who were criticizing other Christians for focusing on the gaps. They were telling them, God is the God of all knowledge. In other words, basically everything I was saying in my opening statement, I didn't appeal to any gaps. So uh, Henry Drummond, for instance, who was a Scottish Christian evangelist, biologist, member of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, in his book, The Ascent of Man, writes, there are reverent minds who ceaselessly scan the fields of nature and the books of science in search of gaps, gaps which they will fill up with God. And if God lived in gaps, what view of nature or truth is theirs whose interest in science is not in what it can explain, but in what it cannot? Whose quest is ignorance, not knowledge? Whose daily dread is that the cloud may lift? And who, as darkness melts from this field or from that, begin to tremble for the place of his abode? What needs altering in such finely jealous souls is at once their view of nature and of God. Nature is God's writing and can only tell the truth. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So Christians come up with science, and then other Christians go for God of the gaps types arguments, and then other Christians criticize that God of the gaps type reasoning, and atheists claim that this is their criticism of, uh, of these types of arguments. This is a criticism put forward by Christians to criticize the idea that we focus on the gaps and not all of knowledge. So for Drummond and Bonhoeffer argued the same thing, Coulson argued the same thing. Uh, they're pointing out that God is the God of all knowledge and that it's what we know. It's what we know that affirms God's existence, not what we don't know. He dismisses the design argument by asking who designed the designer. Um, I didn't use that, but uh, I think this is a bad criticism of arguments from design. So uh, if you had taken an argument from design, something like you know, an argument from DNA or something like that, that the most sophisticated information storage system in the universe uh, happens to be inside your cells, and wouldn't it be amazing if, would it be, a, I mean, how amazing would it be if that just uh, you know, came about by some natural process? I mean, the information storage system in DNA makes the information storage system in my laptop look like a complete joke. So. 
Wouldn't it boggle your mind if that happened by natural means? And the response is, well, if that requires a designer, then who designed the designer? Uh, there's a problem, though. When we talk about biological design, biological complexity, we're talking about parts that look like they're put together in some order arrangement for some kind of purpose, and we can't imagine those parts coming together in that order to serve that purpose by anything that's available by natural means. Is that, sort of, is that the sort of reasoning that would apply to God? I don't see how. We're not, we're not talking about God. Well, God looks like he's parts arranged to serve some sort of purpose. You're talking about completely different kinds of things here. He gives the story of uh, Sagan's dragon. Sagan's uh, dragon in my garage story. It's a parallel of Antony Flew's Is There a Gardener story, but atheists don't like to quote the Flew story anymore since he became a theist. <laughs> but uh, uh, Flew's story makes the same point, but I think is much stronger than uh, Sagan's point. So Sagan's argument compares looking for God to looking for a dragon in your garage. And that's the problem. If you're looking for God the way you would uh, look for some creature, say a dragon or the flying spaghetti monster, uh, of course you're going to come up empty-handed. But if you'd like a more interesting parallel, I mean, try asking if there's a garage, was there an architect? If there's a garage, is there a foundation to the garage? Uh, if there's a garage, did someone build the garage? So those are the, so the sorts of questions that would parallel arguments for theism, not, hey, there's uh, there's an invisible dragon in my garage. As for the problem of evil, uh, I don't have very long, but uh, my thinking on this is uh, is very different from, from from the way atheists tend to think of it. I, I try to make sense. Uh, I'm trying to make sense of the universe, and I guess atheists are, are, are trying to do the same thing there. But uh, in, in doing that, as I went back to my uh, uh, my opening statement, um, if my argument wasn't clear. Uh, there are people, there are people historically who came up with a, a, a new way of doing things that was drawn from their worldview and they were proven to be right about some things that would be very amazing if we didn't believe them already, right? We all, we all believe them already, so it's, not, it's nothing surprising to us. We all believe them, whether we're atheists or Christians or whatever, because they prove them to be true. But before they prove them to be true, they believed them. They believed them when they set out, when they launched the scientific revolution. And so I'm looking at how we make sense of the universe and people who came up with these uh, views, going out and proving them and defending them, I have to say that is very amazing that they took these ideas and they turned out to be right when they were tested. So I look at them and I say, they make sense of a lot of things. That makes sense of why there are neat little mathematical equations at the bottom of reality. That makes sense from a Christian perspective. Uh, why we are the kinds of things that can understand the universe. That makes sense from a Christian perspective. So I'm trying to make sense of the world. And the response is, well, why is there so much suffering? Even here, if I'm even trying to make sense of the objection, as he pointed out, there, there are people, people offer explanations, the Odysseys, and God does it for this or that, or religious explanation because of the fall or because of sin or something like that. Um, taking a step back from that, I can't even understand the criticism unless we have a moral law that we're all agreeing to somehow, unless we believe that there is a moral standard that we all must ad adhere to, think about what the atheist is saying in these types of arguments. They're saying, hey, here's a moral standard, a moral standard that I'm aware of that even God must adhere to. Does that make any sense whatsoever from an atheistic perspective to say that, you, one, that there is a moral standard that if God existed, he would be bound to, and two, that you have access to that moral law? This is very similar to the situation in science where people are making all sorts of amazing claims about the universe, but they make sense on Christianity. They make absolutely no sense on atheism. And that's why Christians can discuss the problem of evil and offer theodicies and explanations and so on. And it makes sense to do that from within our worldview. But once you step outside of that, where you have no moral standard that you could possibly defend, now these things all break down and we're left with uh, nothing that makes sense. Apart from that, he offered some criticisms of Christianity. Well, you know, Christians find Jesus in prison. I was in jail, by the way, when I became a Christian. 
Uh, what about all the other religions Christianity has? You know, uh, what about all these other religions? Is this really fair? Uh, those don't seem to be on the topic, does God exist? And so if Dr. Shermer would like to debate whether Christianity is true, I'd be happy to debate that at a future date. Right now, I'd certainly say God exists. Dr. Shermer. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, so i got to come back and hit this uh, atheism thing again. Um, it's like vegetarianism. No, 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 no. We like meat. No, sorry. <laughs> just a little joke for my animal rights friends. <laughs> uh, I'm a reducitarian, you know, just reduce the Meatless Monday. Okay, I'm just... For most vegetarians, there's one or two reasons they do it. it it's either lifestyle, health, or moral reasons uh, because of the brutality against animals. Um, this has nothing to do with where did all this stuff come from in the first place? All right, well, theists say it came from God. Atheists say I don't believe that. That still leaves the question open, well, where did it come from? Okay, so now you're back on the page of science. And there is no Christian science. Well, there is that religion, but there's no Buddhist physics, Christian physics, Hindu physics, nothing like that. There's just physics. If you go to India, most people are not Christians. But, 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 but the, those that do physics, they do the same physics we do. Because the physical world really exists. It's knowable. We can know it. And it's good to know. That's our point of agreement there. Uh, but that's open to everybody. You don't have to be a Christian. You can be anybody. It doesn't matter, again, it doesn't matter what the uh, religious attitudes were of those who pioneered uh, the scientific revolution. You might as well have said, well, they were all Republicans or Democrats or Whigs or Tories or, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. The point is they discovered something that you and I can discover, that anybody can discover anywhere in the world, and religion's not like that. This is why there are so many different religious groups based geographically. If you happen to have been born by chance, some other part of the world or some other time in history, 10,000 years ago, 500 years ago, you would not believe the stuff you believe today. You wouldn't. Uh, but science is not like that. We know that physics works the same way on the other side of the galaxy and probably on the other side of the universe. Uh, for example, my friend Deepak Chopra uh, is a Buddhist, sort of. He hails from the Eastern uh, wisdom traditions, a little bit of Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. He loves science. And to the extent that he does some science, like he recently published a paper showing the, uh, the benefits of meditation, the physiological and psychological benefits of meditation, measurable, even genetic benefits of meditation. Okay, this has nothing to do with his Buddhism. His Buddhism led him to meditate because it works for him, and it got him interested in studying meditation, but meditation either works or it doesn't. It doesn't matter what your religion is, irrelevant. I'm just trying to come at this different ways. Um, all right, things look designed, they look purposeful. Yes, yes, that's right. Because that's how nature's laws operate. And until Darwin, we didn't have an explanation for why wings look like they're designed to fly and eyes look like they're designed to see. It was Darwin that gave us a bottom-up mechanism that shows through natural selection how these complex organs can come about through simpler gradations Simpler structures through gradated change over long periods of time. How long? Hundreds of millions, even billions of years, that's enough. That's enough time. So it's okay to say, yeah, the eyes were designed to see. Yes, that's true. The design is nature. Now, if you want to say, well, I think God uses natural selection to create complex life, just like God uses gravity to create solar systems, fine. I, I don't have a big beef about that. Those are just words we're using. Ultimately we, ultimately, we don't have an explanation for why the laws of nature are exactly the way they are. We have half a dozen interesting theories about this, but you know that's still one of those great open questions that maybe one of you uh, graduate students will figure out. As for the dragon's garage builder, <laughs> well, uh, we can film the garage being built by the garage builders. We have lots of examples of artifice makers. They're called artisans. 
It's us, people. We can see that. There's nothing like that for the universe. You say, well, well, I think God did it. Okay, where's the, where's the empirical evidence for that? Well, I can see his works. I know you can see the works. I can see the garage, but I know who made the garage. We can film it being made. We can call up the construction company and ask for the blueprints. Did you make this garage? Yeah, bring the blueprints. Okay, there we go. There's nothing like that for theists. It's all this, but I just kind of feel like there just has to be, it just, gosh darn it, there has to be an explanation for this. I'm not satisfied with I don't know, and no one knows. There's got to be an answer. No, no, there doesn't have to be an answer. It's okay to say, I don't know. Where'd the universe come? I don't know. I don't know where it came from. Might have been quantum fluctuations in the quantum foam. It might have been colliding brains of different universes. Might have been collapsing black holes that trigger another a Big Bang explosion. I'm just rattling off a few of these uh, hypotheses that are put forth by cosmologists that have not been confirmed yet. These are just uh, ideas we have that can be tested. Uh, but, but in all cases, in science, it's always okay to just say, let's work on that problem some more. Before we leap to the supernatural, let's say, let's look to see what we have in the natural world first. Science is only a few centuries old. We have a long ways to go to understand nature. Just barely there, just scraping by. And those gaps will be filled. Ultimately, this is what we do. We fill gaps. Again, repeating myself on that. But even if you said, well, okay, I, I really think there's a supernatural being out there, outside of space and time, and, and that's why, like, the dragon is not measurable. Okay, if it's supernatural, if it's not measurable, how do you know it's there? And you can't just say, well, I feel it in my heart, or it just seems like there should be, or one of these uh, logical sequences of infinite regress and that sort of thing. No, no. We, we need actual some, some empirical evidence. So this is why I could back up a little bit on the uh, extraterrestrial intelligence hypothesis. My, my, my last law, I call it my last law because I don't believe in naming laws after yourself. So the first shall be last and the last shall be first. <laughs> so Shermer's last law is just a tongue in cheek. It's not even original to me. It's, the, it's an old sci-fi idea that uh, any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. Of course, I got the idea from um, Asimov's three laws, the third one, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, so just walk, walk you through that for a second. There's a guy who's a quadriplegic, and he has a chip in his motor cortex yoked to his computer, and he can just think thoughts and he moves the computer cursor. He can play games, he can answer emails, he can type and so forth. If you didn't know he had a chip in his brain, it would look like telekinesis, like these psychic powers. But once you know that there's a chip there, you go, oh, I know the technology. Any sufficiently advanced technology looks like magic. Okay, so imagine how far our technology and science will be, not in 50 years, which is surely gonna be impressive, just go back 50 years and look what we have. Now take that out another 50, or 500, or 5,000 years, or take it out 50,000 years or 500,000 years of cultural technological progress. Imagine what we would be able to do. We can already genetically engineer life forms and some pretty amazing technologies. Uh, with just 50 years of, of progress. If we encounter an extraterrestrial intelligence, they're not going to be just like five years ahead of us, or 50 years ahead of us, like the UFO people think about Roswell, you know, the spaceship landed in Roswell, and we back-engineered silicon chips from them. Really, we went from vacuum tubes to, 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 to transistors uh, from the aliens. They traversed the vast distance of interstellar space on 1950s silicon chips? Come on, really? And they're going to speak English with an Indian accent with gnarly stuff on their forehead, walking around bipedal? No, 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 no. This is too much science fiction. They're not going to be anything like us, technologically, morally, and so forth. They'll be able to do things that to us will look like the stuff we would do that would look like to a Neanderthal, a cell phone. It looks supernatural. It's not. 
It's not supernatural when you know the technology behind it. So my question is, is how would you know if you encountered God? That it wasn't just some super advanced ET capable of doing these amazing things. Well, but what about curing cancer? We're, we're going to be able to do this. It's a harder problem than we thought. It's not five years away, probably not 50 years away, but it's surely 500 years away. Surely we will get there, genetically reprogram the tumors, uh, you know, stop the cell division with the telomeres and all that. We'll get there. That would look like a supernatural miracle healing, but it isn't once you know the technology. Okay, okay, but, but God is outside of space and time. Can't be an ET. Um, okay, but how do you know? Well, he, he reaches in periodically to stir the particles. Uh, well, if he does that, then we should be able to measure the particle stirring. Like if he reaches in to cure cancers, how does he do it? Does he reprogram every uh, genome in every cancer cell uh, uh, by hand? Or how, how, how is this done? And if, it, and if that's what God does, then we should be able to measure it, see it. And, and not with stuff that gets better anyway. Because then we're back to the problem of how do you know it's not something else? So that this is why there's this webpage, Why God Hates Amputees. It's, it's, a little, it's a little in your face, but it makes a point. Why is it God only seems to heal things that happen, might have happened anyway? But... Humans never grow limbs, never, never documented. You hear stories, oh, I met somebody who was at this revival and they knew somebody who said they saw, no. Got to have it on film, I want to see it. Uh, why, why does that never happen? Because God works in mysterious ways or because there is no God? I think that's the likeliest scenario. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move into our second rebuttal. Dr. Wood. Thank you again, Dr. Shermer. Um, he again says that the religion of the pioneers of the scientific revolution is irrelevant. He says it's like, there's, it's like saying, well, they, they were Republican or some other irrelevant detail. Um, no, it's not. If someone's claims about the universe flowed directly from the fact that they were Republican and then they went out and tested these claims and they were claims that the general population of the world would have rejected and that Republicans were the only ones putting forward these claims and then they, were, they went out and tested them and they were confirmed, well, that would be a parallel, but these two cases aren't parallel. Uh, Christians, because of their theology, came up with certain claims about the world um, again, claims that most of the world's population would have been, would have rejected, but claims which most of the world's population accepts now. Why? Because they went out and defended and proved them. He said that there's no Christian science. It's all Christian science. Everyone just agreed and adopted the views that Christians put forward and defended. Uh, Christians are the ones who put forward these ideas. Again, any other culture could have put forward the same ideas and gone out and done experiments to defend them. It was Christians. Christians defended these claims. And now people in general believe that the universe at bottom is rational, that we are the kinds of things that can go out and do this, that knowledge is good, and so on. So atheists simply aren't really atheists. They're heretical, rebellious Christians because they've adopted a Christian worldview and just don't know it. He says that Darwin gave us an explanation for complex life. This actually ties into a, a lot of what, what I've been saying, um, because this goes back to what I said about the, the beginning of the scientific revolution. Assuming that you had a Darwinian view, you didn't have it yet, but assuming that as an atheist, before the scientific revolution, you had a Darwinian view that could explain something about how you got here and your faculties and so on. Would you have concluded that you can go out and understand the universe? Interestingly, Darwin himself started to know a problem here. He was responding to someone's argument book, arguing for design in the world, and Darwin said, hey, I agree with you. It really looks like that. And then he said this, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind 
which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions in such a mind? Think about what he's saying there, because he started off very confident about going out and proving things and so on. By the end, after following his worldview to its logical conclusion, human beings are what? Well, we've developed over a long period of time, but as far as our cognitive faculties, our ability to form convictions and so on, to make claims about the universe and so on, uh, those abilities, our cognitive faculties, were selected. What were they selected by? Natural selection. Natural selection doesn't favor coming up with accurate conclusions about the origin of the universe or about the laws of nature. Natural selection favors traits that help you survive and reproduce. So the only thing you can sort of trust that system with would be things that involve finding a mate or using a spear against an enemy or avoiding poisonous berries. Those would be the sorts of uh, faculties that would help you survive and reproduce. At no point would you say, hey, I have this awesome mutant berry finding ability. It really helps me find berries. Therefore, it'll help me uncover the secrets of the universe and the laws of nature and the origin. You wouldn't think that. And so notice the difference, notice the contrast between the pioneers of the scientific revolution who are saying, we were made to figure these things out. We were made to uncover the secrets of the universe. We're made for this because we're made in the image of God. So one worldview would lead you to go out and think that you can actually discover the secrets of the universe. The other would lead you to think, I'm just not made for that, and how can I trust my faculties with anything beyond the, ver the bare minimum? He says that science will fill in the gaps. Again, I haven't, appealed, I haven't appealed to any gaps this evening. I'm not appealing, hey, here's something we don't know, therefore God. Um, now, the problem with his response is that he's saying that science is filling in gaps and so on. Science is going to fill in gaps, but every scientific hypothesis that's tested, whether confirmed or disconfirmed, is going to affirm and confirm that initial scientific hypothesis put forward by Christians. So the more scientific discoveries you come up with, the more you've shown that they were right when they suggested that the universe can be understood, that we can go out, that we can develop mathematics or anything else we need to uncover the secrets of the universe, and that it's good for us to know. The more scientific experiments you do, the more you're confirming the hypothesis, the more you're confirming the beliefs that led them to this hypothesis, and so no amount of science is ever going to disconfirm their views. It'll only add more confirmation. So fill in those gaps. It only helps. Now, Shermer's last law. Again, this was the, the first article I read. Uh, but any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable for, from God. And this would apply, I think, to things like design in biology or something like that. Um, something that looks like a miracle. Again, I don't think it would apply to a universe or something like that, unless you're talking about aliens outside the universe. But I I've always found this argument interesting. Because think about this. If God did exist, um, I'm not saying he did, but if he did exist, for you atheists, would you want to know it? Some of you might say yes, some of you might say no. But if you did want to know that God exists... Uh, wouldn't you need some sort of method to figure out if he exists? Some, something that could lead you to the truth about that? According to Dr. Shermer, there can be no such method. Because anything God could possibly do, you could say, aliens did it. Powerful aliens that are vastly beyond us. So it's built into the methodology that you could never know whether God exists or not. And if it's built into your methodology to never know the truth about something, I have to question the methodology. Methodology should be designed to get us to the truth. So, and notice, other criticisms. Why doesn't God heal amputees? What evidence would that be for God if God healed amputees? You could just say God, I mean, you could just say aliens did it. Hey, look, that amputee was just healed. Look, a miracle. Look, someone just showed up striking lightning bolts saying, believe in me. Could be aliens. Could, right? So given the methodology, there is absolutely no way to prove that God exists. And I think that says something about the debate tonight. If you set up your methodology from the beginning, if you decide what you want to believe and then develop your methodology so that it always leads to the desired conclusion, what does that prove? I could do that with all kinds of things, and there's nothing you could ever do. If, if I say, hey, I believe I'm in the matrix, how can you prove me wrong? Well, you can't. 
There's nothing you could do that, that could prove me wrong. If I say anything God could do, aliens could do, well, then there's no way that you could ever believe in God with that methodology. I would suggest a new methodology. And so you can either decide what you want to believe ahead of time and then develop your methodology to get you the desired results, but can you claim to be a champion of science if you're deciding the results you want ahead of time and then designing the method to confirm what you want to believe? That doesn't sound like science to me. Dr. Shermer, your rebuttal. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, th there, there are arguments that um, natural selection would not have designed our senses to give us an accurate picture of the world, only to survive long enough to leave behind offspring and so forth. Um, uh, and that's a legitimate theory. It's a guy named Donald Hoffman at uh, UC Irvine who, who proffers this idea. Uh, but I disagree, I, I wrote skeptically of that, because how is it we're able to, say, get spacecraft to Mars? Uh, because there really is a reality, and, and we really are improving our capability of measuring that reality, detecting that reality, predicting that reality, and that would not be the case if uh, we did not have the senses to really be able to do that. Not perfectly. And, and this get, gets me to the second point, that we're made in God's image. What does that mean? I mean? Of course, it doesn't mean you know, bipedal primate, obviously. Well, what does it mean? Well, a rational being. Yeah, well, we're not very rational. <laughs> Most of the time, we're pretty irrational. I mean, I write about this for a living every month in Scientific American. Here's the next way we deceive ourselves. We're fooled. Uh, confirmation bias and motivated reasoning and hindsight bias and all the different ways that, uh, that illusions and magicians fool us and so on, we're, we're not very godlike at all. So, so what does that mean? We have the capacity to do some reasoning. Okay, yeah, we do. That doesn't sound very godlike to me. Not to mention our emotions. This is sort of a different subject. You know, Old Testament Yahweh is not a very pleasant fellow. Uh, he was a jealous God, says right there in the Ten Commandments. I am your God, a jealous God. Jealousy? I know people that have gotten over jealousy. I mean, come on, really? This is a characteristic of God? We're made in this image? All right, this is a word, God, that we use to fill in gaps. I don't have an explanation. I don't know. God. It's just a word. We don't, we don't really know what that means. It's just a, I've hit an epistemological wall I can't go any further. Ontologically speaking, I don't know what the reality is beyond my epistemological wall, so we'll just throw that into the realm of the supernatural. Okay, this is why I like to say there's no such thing as the paranormal or the supernatural. There's just the normal, the natural, and the stuff we haven't explained yet. It's like the witch's theory of causality. We replaced that. We debunked it. We replaced it with meteorology, germ theory of disease, and so on. And that's the fate of the supernatural and the paranormal. It just gives way to the natural and the normal. Or it just goes away because the so-called mysteries end up not being mysteries at all. They were pseudo-mysteries. Like, how do women fly on brooms anyway? They don't. Oh. So I don't have to explain it. No, you don't have to. We don't need some physics of broom flying. Except in Harry Potter, apparently. <laughs> um... It's a little bit like when cosmologists talk about dark matter and dark energy. Those are just linguistic placeholders. They're just words because we have to speak to one another to communicate what we're doing. So we're going to call it that for now until we figure it out what it is. We know it's there because the rotation of galaxies, the structure of galaxies, the accelerating expansion of the universe, we know there's something there. We're going to call it dark energy and dark matter. But cosmologists don't mean that as an explanation. That isn't, that's the answer. Those are just words we use to say, this is what we're calling it for now. Now let's get to work and see if we can figure out what it is this stuff is. What is this dark matter energy? What is this dark matter? We don't know. Again, half a dozen theories. You can work on it, so forth. 
But, but for the theist, God, the word, is the equivalent of dark energy, dark matter, but stopping the, the search there. It's like, that's it. That's my answer. That's not an answer. It's just a word. W what is it that this God is like? What, what does he do? How does he do it? You know, God creates universes. How? Does he use collapsing black holes to a singularity to spark another Big Bang explosion? Does he cause brains from separate universes to collide with one another and that creates a new universe? That's just an engineering feat. Or if, again, if he cures cancer, how does he do it? Inquiring minds want to know. So we have to be careful when we throw these words out. Uh, what, what do you mean exactly? God created in his image. What does this mean? Scientists have very specific meanings of terms. And the terms change because we get better at explaining what the actual causal underlying mechanism is. That is what science does. So in a way, yes, David, uh, I don't think the God you're thinking of is detectable by science. I, I don't think there's some experiment we're going to run, some clever set of arguments that will be presented tonight or some other night. And like, yes, that's it. The scales have fallen from my eyes. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Believe me, I've been looking since I was a teenager. <laughs> uh, and, and I don't think it's possible. Uh, again, uh, for the same reason, I don't think the paranormal... Let's go back to, to, to the paranormal for a second. Uh, the, the guy with the chip in the brain. Okay, so, so, say there's no chip in the brain. Let's say it turns out that people really can read each other's minds. Uh, because it has something to do... This is an actual theory. Uh, has something to do with the microtubules inside the neurons inside your brain. And uh, because of quantum fields, the collapse of the wave function in the subatomic particles inside the microtubules in your neurons causes consciousness to sort of come and go in waves that are patterns that can affect your quantum field in your neurons. And so you could read my mind and I can read your mind. Okay, I don't believe any of this. I, I, I've been skeptical about this for a long time. But this is a legitimate theory. Okay. Let's say that turned out to be true. ESP would no longer be some spooky, mysterious, paranormal, psychic. It would just be quantum physics and consciousness, or quantum consciousness as it's called. Uh, it, it would just be part of science, part of the natural world. It would be like, oh, yeah, 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 people can read each other's minds. That's so cool. Uh, here's how you do it. You get in the state of mind, you get your quantum field going, and boom, boom, boom. It, it, it would take the mystery out of it. Same thing with the God hypothesis and the supernatural idea. Let's get, if it's there, let's drill down and see if we can find it. If it is, it's just part of the natural world. We incorporate it into science. Or it's not there and there's nothing to explain. So I think that's where we're at. I think that's kind of what we've come to here tonight, that... It's not a scientific question in that sense. There could be some superior entities out there that we will one day encounter in our starships or whatever, uh, or maybe they'll come here or something like that, but that's not what you're thinking of when you're thinking of the theistic God. That's, a, that, that's just a, a word. It's a linguistic placeholder, and I think we need to lose it. Thank you. We will now have 10 minutes of crossfire with each of our debaters having one minute. And we are going to start with Dr. Wood. Uh, one second, just let me get the timer. Let's sit here. Uh, let's set up 10, minutes, 10 minutes, and then we just have to make sure we switch we'll at the minute. end of each minute very quickly. Um, Dr. Shermer, I'm still con concerned about this Shermer's last law. On the one hand, you keep saying, <laughs> Don't break that uh, law. <laughs> hey, we need to, uh, if, if God exists, we need to find him. We need to figure out how God does things. We need to figure out how the explanation works. We need to figure out how he, uh, how he solves these problems and so on. But on the other hand, you're saying that advanced aliens would be indistinguishable from God, and if they're indistinguishable, then God would be indistinguishable from aliens. So I'm just interested in what, according to your worldview, which includes Shermer's last law, 
what could God possibly do to show that he exists? And if there's nothing, there's nothing that he can do to show that he exists, is this method really designed to get to the truth of the matter? A large cash deposit (laughs) in my name in a Swiss bank. I have the routing number here, uh, just in case because I've been asked this before. And the amount, um, I think 10 million would do it. Okay, I'm just being partially facetious. <laughs> but I'm after there is something that wouldn't happen otherwise, uh, I suppose. But again, I think we're getting caught up in the words, the language. Forget, call it God or aliens, whatever. Is, is there some advanced intelligence a designer, call call it whatever you want. Um, Maybe. How do we know? Our methodology is actually pretty good for finding out. Uh, Since I mentioned Sagan, you know, the SETI program has algorithms that they grind through of signals coming from space to determine if it's random noise or if it's a signal. All right, my minute. Um, So, now, jokingly, of course, uh, a large cash deposit in the bank, now, of course, this could easily be explained by aliens. And then the only example, the serious answer you gave was something that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, Like the limb, growing a limb. And then we shifted to some sort of higher intelligence. Uh, Now notice, this it's over and over again in this debate, it's been, um, hey, if God exists, then, you know, where's the evidence and how, why can't we find the evidence and uh, hey, we, we, should, we should be skeptical and, and demand evidence and so on. But when we ask, what evidence could God possibly give in any possible world that would count as evidence for the existence of God? The answer is something that, would ha- that wouldn't happen otherwise. But something that wouldn't happen otherwise, according to Shermer's last law, could be explained by aliens. So once again, we're left with a methodology that can't possibly investigate this matter. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, amphibians can grow new limbs. Why can't your God do it? Okay, that would be an example. There's lots of um, Iraqi veterans coming back with missing limbs. Most of them are Christian. Most of them have Christian families who pray for them. How come that never happens? And who gets the blame? Not God. Why not? So that's a flawed methodology that can never get us to an answer. Bad things happen or good things happen. Either way, God gets the credit but not the blame. So th- that's the deeper flaw there. In terms of evidence for, okay, <clears throat> you know, all facetiousness aside, um, what do you mean by God? Again, if it's, if it's just something that in, in, the stars are, are, have written in the sky, Shermer, I'm here. <laughs> okay, that would get my attention. However, I have seen Copperfield and Penn and Teller do some... Uh, Pretty amazing things with magic that I, I'm not sure that it could be uh, discerned as supernatural, given the power of illusions and magic and our brain's ability to be fooled. All right, I got a couple <laughs> extra seconds here. Um, here again, because I, I'm very concerned with methodology. If we are trying to determine the existence of X, where X can be wildly different, if we're trying to determine whether there's some sort of planet um, past Neptune or something like that. If we're trying to figure this out, uh, it it helps to have a method that can investigate the question. If you're talking about something um, something uh, less physical, if you're talking about something like laws of nature or logical truths or something like that, it helps to have some sort of method in place to determine these kinds of things. If we're if we're debating the existence of God, there should be some sort of method to determine whether God exists. And here again, why can't amputees grow new limbs? How, how would you say that's God and not aliens doing it? So we're back to this issue of God can do absolutely nothing to prove his existence. Oh, look, we concluded that he doesn't exist. Well, that's a big surprise. 20 more seconds on your next minute. Over. So. Uh, I, no, I started at 45. Just, I started I start at 545. We're just having so. an exchange here. Oh, it's okay. We sorry, don't have to. Okay. I'm not... I'm okay, not, let's just keep it in general. Right. Whatever. We're, we're not greedy. Um, well, what would you... How, how would you tell the difference between, say, you, you prayed for somebody um, and let's say they're, they're, they had cancer and the cancer went away. 
And you know that sometimes cancers do go away, regardless of whether they're prayed for or not, and so on. How can you tell the difference between this one was a miracle, God intervened, this one was not a miracle, God did not intervene? What would be your methodology for that? Oh, I, 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 I actually agree with that point. Um, it, I can say, hey, you know, this happened, this, this really boggles the mind, and I'm going to believe that uh, God did this. Uh, but I'm, I'm, so, I'm in a similar boat to you in terms of being skeptical when people tell me things. When someone says, hey, I was sick and I got better, I generally think, no, you just got better. Um, there are some instances where, um, where I, I, I often think, okay, well, this really sounds, uh, this really sounds shocking. Uh, so I, I, I leave the door open, but I, I'm, I'm in that ballpark where I would say, you know, I don't know, it looks like a miracle, or I don't know, it doesn't look like a miracle. Um, but, you know, if we we're talking about something like a dead man rising from the dead or something like that, then, then I would count that. But that would be a, a bigger debate on whether that happened. Well, that, that, that would be a miracle by your definition. And uh, so what is your explanation for these innocent children who die of childhood leukemia or starvation in Africa or whatever? Why, why does God allow this to happen? Uh, that's not something I'm even going to attempt uh, here in a minute. I did an entire uh, doctoral dissertation on, uh, on the problem of evil. Um, but he, here again, for purposes of this debate, uh, I, I think it would be, David, given these problems, why don't you reject the existence of God? Here again, I can only understand the problem. I can only understand uh, why human beings would regard this as a problem um, if I'm convinced that there's some moral law that makes it a problem, right? If I'm sitting here saying there's a transcendent moral law that any being, any rational being, any rational moral be being would have to adhere to and obey, um, and that I'm applying to God, that makes no sense from a, from a naturalistic perspective. I couldn't trust moral judgments enough to say God would have to do this or God would have to do that. I'm not that kind of thing. So as a theist, I can say, yes, I can wrestle with the problem of evil, try to come up with explanations, but if I can't understand the problem without theism, I, I just can't, uh, I can't see this being a problem well, for theism. Well, can you see something like, uh, let's just take a moral principle of truth-telling, keeping your promises and being honest. You get married, you take your vows, I will not cheat on you, boom. Now, whether there's a God or not, do you not agree that that is a good principle? Good by the standards of you and your spouse and your relationship and the principle of commitment. It doesn't matter if there's a God or not. Doesn't that principle exist really in your mind, in your spouse's mind, Yes, the principle would exist, and we would recognize them as good. But if I had, if if I drew from a naturalistic perspective, I would have to say, what's the status of this moral belief I have? And I, there's only kind of two places you can go for a moral explanation. You can say I'm, I'm hardwired to believe that, um, the way a lion is hardwired to, uh, you know, kill the cubs of a competing tribe before it moves in, in which case, what does that have to do with it being moral or not? It's just the way I'm hardwired. And the alternative is, it's just been taught to me by society, in which case, I mean, there are cultures in the world where if a girl walks down the street without a male escort, they will uh, slaughter her and it will be her family doing it. And they are absolutely convinced that it is bedrock morality to do that sort of thing, so I can't depend on society. But we so know that if, they are wrong, and that's why we condemn that correctly. Without a God, the, the violation of an individual's autonomy and control over their own body is an absolute moral principle that should be withheld and defended. And I think you would agree with that, and it stands whether there's a God or not. Um, I agree that that is, that is a moral standard. If there is no transcendent moral, like, like there are, pl there are you know forms how, of you, Platonism you know and so on. You know how to test it? You know how to know? Ask the women who are violated. They'll let you know. That's not cool. You don't need God for that. And this concludes our crossfire. We're going to go ahead and move into closing statements. Uh, Dr. Wood, if you would please. Good. All right, that ending there is a perfect example to really uh, sum up this debate. Uh, 
This is just a moral law. That's the way it is. It's true whether or not God exists. Again, uh, how could you possibly defend that from an atheist, athe atheistic perspective? You just have to stomp your foot and then clap your hands and say, this makes sense. Um, how is someone in Pakistan who kills his sister because he's firmly convinced that this is necessary for the preservation of society, that you have to uphold these standards or you've dishonored your family and so on, how is that person any less correct than someone who says, that's just wrong, you don't do that, you don't need God. Well, you don't need God to believe the moral principle, but here, going back to, if you say you're an atheist, you are telling me something. You're telling me something positive. You're telling me whatever explanatory resources you have, they're outside the realm of theism. So, given atheism, and I'm here I'm thinking in the strong sense of naturalism, given atheism in that kind of sense, where you don't have any resources for explaining our moral feelings other than it's hardwired in some sense, versus, well, uh, society teaches us that. If your belief is based on what society teaches, guess what? Beliefs change from society to society. And that man's society teaches him that you have to kill your sister if she walks down the street with a man that she's not related to. The alternative is we're hardwired. We're just hardwired to believe that certain things are wrong. Uh, hardwiring, how could you possibly how could you possibly explain or defend this in terms of hardwiring? Again, a lion will kill the cubs of a competing pride. What does that have to do with it being moral? It helps it pass on its genes. What does that have to do with whether it's good or bad? And so you just have, as an atheist, you just have to stomp your foot and say this is the way things are. Well, that's how it is with everything else we've been talking about this evening. If you say, hey, atheists, before you knew that the universe, again, is governed by neat little mathematical equations, would you have ever expected that? Would you have ever expected the universe to be like that? Of course not. All, it's just physical objects. They, they're not going to follow laws. They're not going to follow neat little statements. Mathematics is a language, ladies and gentlemen. The universe is operating according to language. Is that surprising on theism, where we're told that God upholds and sustains everything by his word? Not surprising at all for theists, and it wasn't surprising for the pioneers of the scientific revolution. It should be horrifying to atheists, because that's the last thing you would expect. If you are an atheist, and you try to figure out where your, how you got your cognitive faculties, these were faculties that were selected because they helped find food or find a mate. Why would you think that those could get you to the truth about the universe? You would never in a million years conclude that they could get you to the truth about the universe. And that's why Darwin began struggling with these kinds of doubts about his convictions. What's the status of my convictions? Given my beliefs about the world, they can't have the status I think they have. And so his, his framework began breaking down as far as his confidence in forming conclusions on, on the big issues. But if you're an atheist, that should be bothering all of you or the goodness of knowledge. Dr. Shermer said he agrees that uh, knowledge is good, even if it had no practical benefit whatsoever. Why? How could you possibly defend knowing what a quasar is if, you had no, uh, if it had no practical benefit ever that it's just good? All of this makes sense from a theistic perspective. Atheists, notice, have absorbed all of these ideas about morality being absolute and not just something that uh, is hardwired into us. They've absorbed the idea that the universe is at bottom rational, that we can go out and discover its laws, that we are the kinds of things, we're, we're made for this sort of discovery, and that it's good for us to know all of these things. All of these came from Christians. And so Christians, when we're asked, why do you believe that the universe is rational? Why do you believe that we can figure these things out? Why do you believe that it's good? All of this makes perfect sense on our worldview. So we have an explanation for all of this, including uh, our claims about why certain things are right or wrong. If you're an atheist, you have no explanation for any of these. You just have to stomp your foot and cling to Christian views of the world and of morality and pretend that they're not just hanging out in midair, given your worldview. Thank you. And Dr. Shermer, you're closing.
Well, thank you again for uh, inviting me here. Um, I'm not going to stop my foot, but let me see if I can give you some reasons uh, for some moral principles. For example, I see you have a wedding band. I assume you're married. Uh, is, is your wife here tonight? No. Okay. So um, let's say I talked to you into being an atheist tonight. <laughs> One can hope. <laughs> you know, would you cheat on your wife tonight? I suspect you wouldn't. Why not? You're not a theist anymore. None of it matters. In a thousand years, we're all dead anyway. There's no purpose to the universe and so on. Why bother? How about this? You don't have to stomp your foot because you love your wife and you don't want to hurt her because you don't like to hurt people that you care for. How about because you promised you wouldn't and you're a man of honor and your word and you believe in keeping your word? How about you wouldn't want her doing that to you? Because that would hurt. How about you wouldn't want to live in a society where no one keeps their promises and everybody cheats on each other? Not just marriage, but business and so forth. We know the basis of a civil society is a rule of law, where people keep their word, keep their honor. That's why you have rules. Good fences make good neighbors and all that. The long arc of the moral universe, as I wrote about in my book, The Moral Arc, is due primarily to humans reasoning their way through, finding these moral principles that work based on what? Based on the survival and flourishing of sentient beings. We are sentient beings. As Jeremy Bentham said, the question about animal, animal rights is not can they think or can they talk, but can they suffer? The suffering of other Sentient beings is our moral starting point. That's where we begin. We build from there. Slavery is outlawed in every nation in the, in the world now. It used to be practiced by every Christian nation. Christians defended slavery vehemently. You can read the literature. I summarize this literature in my book. A pre-Civil War Christian defense by theologians, ministers, priests, and so on of slavery. Slavery. The creator of the universe who wrote this great holy book couldn't even get it right about slavery. Couldn't think, just add an 11th commandment. Thou shalt not enslave thy fellow humans. No, no. Didn't think of that one until 1865. Hey, I know. Maybe we ought to have a, an extra commandment in the Constitution. It's called an amendment. Okay. Torture used to be practiced by all Christian nations. Defended by Christians. Gone. In 1967, early 1967, it was still illegal for blacks and whites to marry, and most Christians favored that. How many favor it today? None, almost none. Posters don't even ask anymore. It's a ridiculous question. Of course, blacks and whites should be able to marry. What's wrong with that? And as you saw last year, the Supreme Court ruled on gay marriage. Some Christians are still struggling with that, hanging on to the old school. No, oh, darn it, that just can't be right. But in five years or so, everyone in this audience will go, yeah, gay, whatever, dude, who cares? Of course they should have the rights to get married. The arc of the moral universe is bending toward justice, not because of religion, in spite of it, but because of reason and science, because we can discover truths by studying them and apply those principles and then test them and measure them and see how, how, well it get, how well it goes by that criteria. So I was once a born-again Christian. I went to Pepperdine University, uh, Church of Christ School, and as I mentioned, and, and so I understand when you're in the bubble, it makes sense. It's logically coherent, internally consistent, until you step out of the bubble and you study other cultures, other people, other belief systems, and you see what works. And I would encourage you to do that. Think outside of the bubble. Think about some of these principles we've talked about tonight and how they stand by themselves. Whether there's a God or not, it's us. It's up to us. It's always been up to us to solve our own problems and not turn to some supernatural force, not wait till the next life, do it now in this life because people matter and our lives matter 
now. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and begin our Q&A. Um, for those of you who have any questions, we have two microphones, one at each side at the front of the aisles. Um, if you would, please limit your questions to no more than 30 seconds. Um, we will give um, each party an opportunity to respond to your questions. If your question is specifically for one party or the other, please state that. Um, also remember that these are for questions. These are not for statements. These are not for uh, platitudes or for you to decide to become part of the debate. This is for you to ask questions of the panelists who are here. Thank you. All right, well, we've got 35 minutes in total. Yes, we're supposed to raise the house lights, I believe, um, for Q&A. So we'll ask the house to uh, go ahead and bring the lights up. Um, we're going to have about two minutes for the uh, primary respondent um, and then about one minute uh, for the other respondent as well per question um, so that we can get as many questions in as we can within the next 35 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, hello. Uh, I just want to thank both of the speakers for coming down tonight. We greatly appreciate both of you uh, dedicating your time to this. Uh, let's see. My question is for Dr. Shermer. Uh, just kind of continuing on the moral question. Uh, so obviously you passionately defended uh, certain moral principles that I think just about everyone can agree on. Uh, so what, in your view, ontologically grounds these moral principles? Would they be something that exists in the same way, say, laws of nature exist? And furthermore, if these are non-scientific moral principles, how can we use an empirical method to verify them? Is it possible to empirically test whether we should promote human flourishing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it really, it's at the, it's at the heart of, of reasoning about moral uh, principles. And, and the answer is, in short, it's not quite like discovering laws of nature, but it's similar to that. I claim that it's, that it's part of our nature, that we evolve the propensity to, uh, as a social species, have to care about the welfare of others. Not always, we don't. It's, a, it's sort of a game theory uh, prisoner's dilemma. You know, if I defect, I get a little short-term benefit, but if I cooperate, he gets a little short-term benefit. I don't get quite as much benefit initially, but down the road, I'll get more benefit, and I can reason my way to being nice to this other person. But it's not... I claim in an evolutionary way, a calculated, cold, Machiavellian, I'm going to use this guy to get what I want, even if it appears, I'm just pretending to be nice. Because he'll know. People can tell if other people are psychopathic, faking, sociopaths. You got to really believe it and really be uh, moral. Wait, I get two minutes, right? Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So, so here's, the, here's the argument, that you, you can't fake being a moral person, uh, because people can read the cues. Uh, and, and so you actually have to feel it, live it, believe it, and, and that's the best we can do. It's part of our nature, we evolved it, and then culture reinforces it. You know, why do I feel guilty about this and another cu culture feels guilty about that? Yes, so cultures tweak the moral emotions, but we all are born with these moral emotions. We can see this in infants. Infants that are, are, are just like six months to a year old. These are complicated experiments, but you can see that they, they, they have a sense of right and wrong. They like the good puppet. They, they hit the bad puppet that does things. Uh, you can see this in chimp, chimps and, and, and other primates. It's part of our nature to have a sense of right and wrong. Dr. Wood, one minute. Um, that goes along exactly with what I was saying. You've basically got two places that you can appeal to for uh, your moral claims or whatever moral feelings you have. Uh, you can uh, be hardwired for them, or they can be uh, something to do with culture, and obviously both are involved. Um, but Dr. Shermer says cultures tweak moral emotions, and we just have these moral emotions. Uh, bed bugs reproduce by violent rape. What does that have to do with right or wrong? They're wired to do that. It helps them reproduce. It helps their species. Their species wouldn't work right now if they didn't do that, because that's the only way they do it. What does that have to do with right or wrong? And so all atheists can really do in these scenarios is, is just say, well, we're, we're wired to do this and cultures tweak it. 
um, what's the standard, right? What's the, there's, there seems to be no standard other than the way we're wired. Just imagine a different situation where humans reproduce by violent rape and it was necessary for our survival. We're wired to do that. Would that make it good and right? I don't see how. Okay, next question. Thank you for both the speakers. Enjoyed the, enjoyed the debate. A uh, question for Dr. Shermer. Um, you mentioned evils such as children dying of illnesses being a problem for Christians. But if you hold to an atheistic, naturalistic, materialistic worldview, and we are nothing more than a highly evolved collection of chemicals, what objective standard do you have to say what is evil and what is not? According to your worldview, what is wrong with a bag of chemicals dying? Well, for starters, if you're that bag of chemicals, you don't like that. And you don't want to be treated that way, so you don't want to treat other people that way because you sense that they feel the same way you feel. Now, this isn't a given. Centuries ago, people didn't think like that as much as we do. So the, the moral arc has, the moral sphere has expanded to include more people because culturally we've passed laws, uh, we've encouraged people to be more civil, and so on. A bunch of other factors going on in there. That has expanded it. And so you care about other people. You genuinely do. Whether there's a God or not, you do, because we're a social primate species. We care about it. We also exploit others, too, so it's a balance. The whole point of a civil society is to tweak the variables to get people to be nicer to one another and attenuate violence and aggression. We're not there yet perfectly, but, you know, we're getting there. Moral progress. Um, so, oh, the, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the question is, uh, what's wrong with uh, these things, um, according to Dr. Shermer's worldview? So he's making certain moral claims about things that are uh, evils. And notice, because this happens over and over again when atheists describe uh, why something is wrong, they explain it in terms of another moral principle that can't be defended. So why is it wrong for this person to suffer, to hurt this person? Well, because you wouldn't want to do it. So there's another moral principle, right? There's another moral principle that you shouldn't do this. Or, and then why is that one? Well, there's this greater moral principle that, you know, you shouldn't violate someone else's autonomy. All of these should, 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 ought, ought, oughts. Um, if we ask what the status of these things are on atheism, you're just wired to do that. Again, uh, how does being hardwired to do something give it the status that we believe it? In, in, we have free will. You have a choice. You have degrees of freedom. In we it. have you free could, will. You could exploit the person, or you could be nice to the person. Interesting. What are you going to do? Yes, absolutely. I'm, we I'm, have free will, ladies and gentlemen. I like that. I agree. Interesting. We found agreement. <laughs> I think for a minute we slipped back into crossfire. Um, okay, question on this side. Thank you. He started. <laughs> My question is for Dr. Wood. Uh, you keep saying that new scientific discoveries actually strengthen your theist arguments. But if you believe these new discoveries and say evolution and cosmology are true, how can you possibly reconcile them with a biblical account of creation? Um, well, uh, there, there are multiple ways to do that. I'm not going to come down on any side um, here. But here, here, here are your options. Um, notice, note, when I read that quote earlier um, about... Um, uh, the, the God of the gaps argument and someone saying, hey, don't, you know, don't, don't go to the gaps. That was an argument defending Darwinism from a reverend. So you basically have that approach saying, hey, whatever we discover out there, that's what we set out to do. And that was actually the general approach of the pioneers of the scientific revolution. They didn't believe in that. It hadn't, it hadn't been proposed yet. Um, but their idea was, and in the, uh, uh, Roger Coates, in the second edition of uh, Newton's great uh, Principles of Mathematics, he started out by saying that however God does something, um, it's, if we're talking about creating laws of nature and creating the world, it's not out of necessity. In other words, it's not like 2 plus 2 equals 4, where you can just sit back in your chair and figure it out for yourself. If you want to know how God creates the world, he argued that you have to go out and explore that, right? And he specifically said, if you want to know how God did something, since it's not of necessity, then the only way to find it out would be to go out into the world and discover how God makes the laws of nature work. 
And so he defended observation and experiment as the grounds for how you would go out and discover how God did certain things in the world. So that's one of, the, I'm saying that because I've talked a lot about the scientific revolution. That's, that's what, that's the method that they proposed. And so um, following that method, if you have good enough evidence for anything, then you'd say, hey, I was, uh, I was able to figure this out uh, using the scientific method. The other would, would be to sort of separate, separate the books, the book of, uh, the book of scripture and the book of, uh, of nature and say, well, um, I think these two are in conflict here. So in other words, you, you, have, you have two approaches. One is to adhere to one and adhere to the other if there seems to be a conflict. The other would be to kind of reconcile them and, and Christians are gonna fall into the, those, uh, those general categories. Uh, but e even if you accepted uh, the idea that there has to be a God for there to be an external objective morality, a moral law, some Archimedean point beyond us that grants it, Shouldn't those moral principles stand in and of themselves, whether there's a God or not? So if God says, you know, lying is bad, murder is bad, whatever, uh, those should be true anyway. So he's really just identifying something that's out there, that's really there. And, but the problem is, of course, is there's many holy books and lots of moral principles from lots of different religious leaders over the last several thousand years, most of which we've rejected as absurd. So what happened? We reasoned our way to this. Okay, next question. Confused, uh, this is from Michael Schirmer. I'm confused about your position on morality. Um, you seem to think, or, or to say that morality is objective, like you've actually violated some real objective standard when you, let's say, violate a woman. But then when we ask for justification, for a grounding, you appeal to what we believe. But there's something objective that's it's independent of what we as individuals or as a, as a group believe. It, like the speed of light is objectively the case, yeah. and our beliefs have no bearing whatsoever. Yeah. Any appeal to our beliefs just doesn't have anything to do with the speed of light. Yeah. So, Let, let's take okay. something like a, a hot button t topic of uh, female genital mutilation. Uh, is that objectively wrong? Ask the women. There's one place to begin to make it objective. Uh, and then you build from there. Would we want to live in a society? Yeah, sorry. I'm appealing to what? To, to a, a woman's belief. You're appealing to human beings. Well, it's right not now. just her belief. It's her autonomy, her rights, her, her, her physical being. But you said ask a woman. That's her, I mean, consult her belief. What she it's a, it's a place it. to start. It's so a place it's to start. Yes, right? you can find women who will say, yeah, I think it's okay. But the long term trend has been away from men lording it over women and, and men controlling re reproductive rights of women. The, the trend in, civil, in Western civilization, which is spreading globally, is that individuals have autonomy over their own selves, all individuals. Blacks, Jews, women, everybody. And it didn't used to be that way, but we overcame that religious tradition that held us back. Is that depending on our beliefs or not? Well, but even if it was, okay, how do you know? If you're saying it's a religious argument and you're getting it from God, how do you know? Do you pray? Does God talk to you? Do you read it in the holy book? How do you know? Where do you get your morals? Oh, it's a, that's a different question of how we know something versus whether it's objectively true. I gave you an answer, okay? The, the survival and flourishing of sentient beings is a moral starting point. How do we know? Ask them. Study them. Look at the effects. Ask yourself, how would I feel if somebody did that to me? How would, and then ask yourself, do I want to live in a society where everybody violates their promises and cheats on each other and commits homicide against each other? Would you want to live in that society? That's as objective as you can get. It's not perfect, but, but, I'm, but I'm coming back to you by saying, if you say, no, no, I get it from, from God or the Bible or whatever, but, but you tell me where you get it, how is that objective? How do you know? What do you mean, how we know something? Yeah. No, um, how do you know what is right and wrong? Oh, we know through, I'd say through our moral sense. I think uh, through innate ideas, that we were implanted with innate ideas of what's right and wrong, even if we don't fully understand them. Um, just like our you know, physical senses, we don't see or hear the same way, but you know, we still perceive reality. I think morally we have I, I think I think sense. we're in agreement, actually. So, it's, so you believe there's an objective reality that's yes. beyond us? Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go ahead and give Dr. Wood one minute to... Give any response? 
here again explaining some moral principle in terms of another moral principle which remains undefended apart from just, you know, sort of again stomping the foot and saying this is the way things are. Um, individuals have autonomy over themselves. And Dr. Schirmer said surviving, the surviving and flourishing of sentient beings is, is the starting point. Now, why prefer humans in this equation? There are many sentient beings apart from human beings. And the, uh, the success of human flourishing and primate flourishing certainly conflicts with the flourishing of many others. Um, on atheism, why prefer humans or primates to any others, you just have to lay down, this is the way it is, this is, this is my species or whatever, and that's why, I'm, uh, that's why I adhere to this. But again, it would be indefensible, whereas the, you know, defending the autonomy or anything else, if people are created in the image of God, we have a different kind of status from everything else. And so here again, things tend to make sense with one worldview and not make any sense at all with another. Okay, next question. Uh, my question is for Dr. Sherman. Um, traditionally understood, or at least as I've understood it, atheism could be defined as the affirmative belief that God does not exist. However, in, in your opening statement and in some of your rebuttals, you refer to atheism defined as the lack of belief in God. Um, I guess you can say my question is a two-part question. The first part being, why would you adopt the definition of lack of belief if it doesn't make a positive statement about reality? And second, would you make the affirmative statement that God does not exist? Sure. Yeah, these, are just, these are just labels. It's sort of a labeling issue. Uh, philosophers make a distinction between weak and strong atheism. Strong atheism, I assert that there is no God. I believe that there is no God. I'm confident that there is no God. Or, you know, I know there is no God. Weak atheism is just, I just lack a belief in a God. There's some other variations. Uh, apathyism, uh, like, like they just don't care. <laughs> I don't care if there's a God or not. <laughs> and I gave you agnosticism, and there's a few others. But forget the labels. Just, you know, do you, the, sort of the ontological question, what is the nature of reality? Is there really a God? Then there's a the question of how do you act? What do you believe? Because that shapes how you act and how you, how, how you behave in the world based on those beliefs. So it, it doesn't really matter whether I'm a strong or weak atheist. I don't believe in God, and I act accordingly. So effectively, call it whatever you want. Uh, I live a life without God, I think. <laughs> it's a little, little joke, just a joke, just telling a joke. Points about the distinction between uh, you know, strong atheism, weak atheism, and so on. If, if you're talking to someone who claims to be an atheist, you would uh, ask for you know, an explanation of, of what you believe. Are you, uh, I, I think of, when I say atheism, I'm usually talking in a, in a strong sense of like naturalism. There, there are no gods or no, nothing supernatural, but some uh, atheists adhere to a, a weaker position. And um, if, if you, um, w what we can agree on is, uh, you know, Dr. Shermer says that the weaker form is just a, a lack of belief in God. So if we want to hold them to a stronger position, we should be sympathetic to our atheist friends who say that they, their position is just one of lack and agree that their position is lacking. Next question. My question's for Dr. Shermer as well, and you said previously in the debate that somewhere along the lines that there has to be a dual credit given to God regardless of result being good or bad. And to go even further, you gave the example of dying children. And my question is, is it not true that when these family chains are broken that they relink again in an eternal world with foreverlasting peace, which is greater than any gift you could ever receive? Whoa, I, I missed the last part. Uh, isn't it true that... <laughs> is it not true that when these family chains are broken, a.k.a. when the children are dying, that they relink again with their parents and their families, which is greater than any gift you could ever receive because it's a foreverlasting peace in an eternal world? Okay, so if I understand what you're saying is that uh, we should tell them that they get to see their kids again in the next life because they'll make them feel better. No, I'm asking no. you, you said that there's no possible way that we, or will you say that as a theist, you should believe that there should be dual credit given to God, be, whether it being good or bad. And I'm in agreement with you. I think there can be dual credit given to God. And what I'm asking is, when those children are dying, you're saying that that's a bad thing and that like, we don't have like a reason for that like happening or whatever. But my answer and my response to that is that when they do die, that they are going to an eternal world where they will see their parents again and they will have an eternal life of forever lasting peace. And is that not greater? Well, I can we see why it? people would believe that for sure, because it would make them feel better. But the question is, is it true? Yeah. And in any case, it's true. <laughs> How do you know? How do you know? 
How do I know if it's yeah. true or not? Have you been there? No, I haven't. That's what I'm asking you. Is it not true? Uh, no, I, I, the burden of proof is not on me to disprove your heaven. There's lots of versions of the afterlife, tons of them. I, my next book is about this. We, you, you have one particular one. How, how do you know that's the right one? Listen, uh, David's giving a lecture on uh, Islam, right? Shortly on the Koran uh, in, in a couple of days or something, right? So, I mean, this is the, the, the big elephant in the, in the political room these days, right? Islam and Islamic terrorism and so forth. Um, you, you realize there's a billion people in the world who believe just as fervently as Christians do in their version of monotheism. They do not accept that Jesus was resurrected, the Son of God, and so on. They don't. And they think you're going to hell for believing the wrong religion. How can we tell the difference between these, just those two? Which is the right one? And, of course, David says, I know, because so on, he'll make his arguments. But I can assure you that you bring them some imams in, they'll go, oh, no, 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 you're misreading the Quran, you've, you've mistranslated this particular word, and you are wrong, Jesus was not resurrected, and it goes on and on. How can we tell? In the world to my talk on Wednesday to challenge me. Um, um, I, I, th I think the point, I think the, the, the point that, that was being made is one about... Uh, the possible coherence of theism on this issue. Um, so I think the point was, um, if you're a theist of some sort, you don't believe that death is the end, and so even if there's some bad thing that happens to a child, that's not the end of the story according to theism, and so maybe that this all works together in terms of, uh, you know, the problem of evil, had, given a theistic context, there are explanatory resources given theism that would allow that not to be the end or something like that. So I, I, think, I think that's, that's kind of the point. Um, not that this is true, um, he, although he might, have, you know, he might believe that, it, um, but if we wanted to make a point with it, it would be that uh, whether it's true or not, if the claim is theism is incoherent because of this suffering, then theism has all kinds of explanatory resources to appeal to for, for talking about suffering. Okay, our next question. My question is for Dr. Shermer, and uh, I guess I consider myself to be kind of agnostic, um, but I don't think God has any correlation um, with, with the earth we live in or even with any religion, but I, I find myself like thinking there is a God because I just look at the start of where everything was, you know, like, and like, how do you dismiss that, you know, like with like the universe, where did the first thing come from, you know, like... Yeah. Those are hard questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Well, maybe we should ask, why is there nothing rather than something? Why isn't there nothing? Um, we know that the universe began with the Big Bang, but it, but it came from something. We know from quantum physics uh, that nothing in the theological sense is, is not exactly true. There's, there's energy in the empty space that bubbles with this sort of quantum foam, they call it. Mind you, I'm a social scientist, so I'm just saying the words that quantum physicists talk about. This is what they do for a living. They have the mathematics and so forth and the physics experiments to show that this is the case. And we know that not all quantum effects are caused. They are truly just uncaused, random uh, events that happen in the subatomic world. It's a weird, weird field of science that's, that's extremely well supported, but very counterintuitive. And the beginning of the universe appears to be something along those lines. Now, it could be there's the universe is infinitely old, that is without a beginning, and, and that our little bubble universe is just the latest incarnation of this, but this sort of quantum foam energy field or something always existed. You know, we just don't know. We don't, we don't know. And uh, again, there's half a dozen theories about this, maybe a dozen. You can read all about it in these popular books people like uh, Brian Greene and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and so forth, uh, that lay it out beautifully. Um, but still, we don't know. And that's one of the great questions. It's really fun to not know. It's okay. Um, tying this into uh, basically my, my position in, in my opening statement, um, think about what, we, what Dr. Shermer was just talking about there. Bubble universes, uh, 
quantum effects, the subatomic worlds, the beginning of the world, uh, all of these things. Um, going back to if you were, assuming, that, assuming, every, assuming everything that, that, that we're hearing about, you know, the origins of, of the universe and so on, uh, were correct. Um, going back to a pre-scientific revolution time, if you were an atheist and you said, hey, these are the kinds of things that are true about the universe, or you were a theist and said, these are the kinds of things that uh, are true about the universe, um, which one of those would you be able to say, hey, if that's true, I've been made to figure this sort of thing out? Uh, I think as a theist, you would say, hey, I'm creating the image of God. God created the universe. I'm rational. This is how, uh, this is how I reflect uh, God's rationality is in uncovering these things. And so you'd think, hey, we are made for these kinds of things. You'd never expect that if you believe what you are according to atheism or naturalism. And so uh, everything, even the descriptions used by atheists, are still confirmation of theism. Our next question. Yes, so my questions for Dr. Schirmer. In preparation for this event tonight, I did go to the library and get a copy of a moral arc and read through it. And what I found in there, the problem is what several other people have said, that there's no basis for the ontology of morality. And in other words, there are moral truths out there. And these truths, if we're going to discover them, which is what you've been talking about, epistemology, they have to exist independently of us, even if we weren't here before we could discover them. So we could picture a universe where we're not here and there are still things that are good. What is the ontological and metaphysical basis then to know that this is something is good or something is evil? And if you don't have that, then you just have relativism and so much then for talk about slavery or children dying or anything like that. Right, well thank you for reading my book. <laughs> I always appreciate that. Um, Right, if there's not absolute morality, then it's all relativism. No, 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 and no. Uh, you know, there's lots of areas in between. You can have moral principles that may not be absolutely 100% always in every circumstance true. And, and that doesn't exist in religion either. So we can just jettison that idea and then start to build from there. Um, so we're not really discovering it, in the, like the, to the early, earlier question, the first question tonight. Um, it's not quite like discovering gravity or electromagnetism or something like that, but it is discovering truths about the human condition, about human nature. In the same way that we know that people have a sense of color uh, or um, a sense of balance or you know certain physical characteristics, we also have a sense of right and wrong. We have a, a very powerful moral instinct uh, that really is responsible for most of the violence in society. Uh, about 90% of homicides are moralistic in nature. Only about 10% are instrumental in nature. That is, I kill him because I wanted the Rolex or his car or whatever. Usually thieves and criminals, when they burgle your house, they're hoping you're not home, especially if you're armed. <laughs> they just want your stuff. Okay. Most of the homicides that occur are, are due to uh, the sense of, you know, he insulted me. He cheated at cards. He scratched my car. He took my parking spot. You know, he, you know, she cheated on me with my best friend. I had to kill her. You know, so those, those are, those are real moral emotions that exist. You can measure them. So the whole point of structuring civil society, as I said, is to try to get people to, you know, bring out the better angels and attenuate the inner demons because they're both there. Nice metaphor from my friend Steven Pinker in his great book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. So in, in that sense, social scientists have discovered those truths by studying human nature and human society. Those are sciences. Just like economics is a science. The Nobel Prize was given today in economics. That's a science. So, so is social science, psychology, experiment, cognitive science. We're discovering truths about humans that are really there. Boy, I really feel bad for a society that uh, governs its, uh, its view of right and wrong based on their emotions. Emotions can uh, change very quickly. Let me get personal here for a second. I'm uh, technically a diagnosed sociopath. I don't have these moral feelings. Um, when I see a bunch of people slaughtered in front of me, I have no bad feelings for it. I don't choose to be that way. I was, I was, I, that's just how I'm wired. I'm defective. I understand that I'm defective in that way. Um, so why don't I 
hurt people or something like that. Well, it has nothing to do with my emotions. They, they're, they're not, they're not what, what guides my behavior. Uh, I, I view people as created in the image of God, so I have no right. I have no right to do certain things uh, to other people. I have to respect um, what they are. I don't get to do whatever I want to people. And so if you throw that out and I just conclude that you know, we're, we're the product of what naturalism uh, would suggest, um, that's why I keep asking this question, because I, t I take this question very seriously. If it's just, hey, here's how we're wired, I'm wired to not care about any of you. Um, if it's a matter of what society teaches, I'm wired to not care what society teaches me. So is there something that's more than our feelings or the, mo or the way that we're wired? If there is, we need to uh, be aware of that. And if there's not, boy, are we in a lot of trouble. Hey, our next question. Earlier, Dr. Sherman, I mean Shermer, earlier you said that um, theists use the word God as a linguistic placeholder, basically saying we don't understand God, we can't feel him, we don't know his presence. Um, by that, you're saying that we can't, you're discounting our faith. But do you not think that you, as an atheist, put a lot of faith in science for things that are essentially flawed? For example, the taxonomic classifications um, there is an Asian elephant and an African elephant. The Asian elephant is tuskless, and the African elephant has tusks, but there are two different genuses. But to the human eye, they look like elephants. Would that not be something that a human would make, saying, oh, this, this elephant can't be the, in the same genus as this elephant because they don't have a tusk? Why? Why not? And also, there's a rule for the taxonomic class classification that says that organisms in different species cannot hybridize, they can't reproduce. But there is an actual um, piece of evidence of the elephant named Mahdi that was um, made by the Asian elephant and the African elephant reproducing, and that was in 1931. So how come you as, a sci as an atheist does not discount the taxonomic classifications that you put so much strong faith in? <laughs> yeah, okay, there's a lot there. Um, so first, of, the first part, uh, it, it's not that, I'm not denigrating faith. It, it's just not a reliable method of knowing the world. That is how I feel about things. Just, you know, I feel like, I feel God's presence, like I said, feel the dragon's presence, whatever. We, we, we can imagine all sorts of things that change how we feel. Uh, that doesn't make them true. Um, now, on the taxonomy question, there, there is a kind of a debate in the philosophy of biology about to what extent species are real. I mean, are they really out there? Are these complete social constructions by biologists? You would know it more in the popular culture is, you know, is race real you know, uh, uh, in human, human groups? Are there really races? It, the, the meme now is that it's a you know, social construction. Races don't really exist. Anyway, um, I tend to favor the side that, that ta taxonomy has been moving ever closer to real units that exist in nature by your, the definition you just gave, uh, reproductive isolation. Now, hybrids do happen. Lions and tigers, if the male's a lion, it's a liger. If the male's a tiger, it's a tiglon. Uh, but they tend not to have viable offspring that continue the line, so they're hybrids, you know, like donkeys or mules, uh, like, like mules. Um, now, it, it, if, if a hybrid group, small group, has a founder population, they floated out to a new island where there was no life forms on it, or started a new population, it would be a new species. And that is how new species are formed, through these founder populations uh, that, then are, that have viable offspring. So those really exist. And the final point on that uh, that I'm encouraged by, my friend Jared Diamond, who studies birds in Papua New Guinea, uh, talks about the, the match between Western trained biologists and his native Papua New Guinean friends he goes birding with. They pretty much come up with the same groupings of species, even though they have different backgrounds, different cultures. So he, uh, we think that those things really exist in nature and we're discovering them. Other comments? Okay. Um, well, that's all the time that we actually have for questions, but thank you all so much. <laughs>